Everyone here, Matt Schwab, President and CEO of Kraken Energy. Um, obviously, a portfolio of um, past producing high grade uranium assets in the United States. And uh, going back and tapping into the potential of those, I think he's got a great thesis here. He's got great experience. He's very well funded, great share structure. And uh, yeah, Matt, looking forward to your chat. And I I'm going to stay live this time. If you don't mind, I might jump in with some questions here and there. Um, uranium's in my blood. So uh, let's let's get it at her. Awesome. Sounds good. I'll share my screen. Yep. <clears throat> All right. You should see my presentation there now, I think. <clears throat> yep, we're good. So as I said, uh, you know, I've been standing behind this, this thought that uranium companies couldn't find a better time, better place than now. And that suits us perfectly, right? Because uh, for anybody unfamiliar, Kraken Energy is a junior uranium exploration and development company for the time being focused solely on the U.S. market. Anybody who has been following uranium, of course, understands that there has been a consistent year-over-year -year increase in the projected uranium demand and deficit that's needed to supply energy for the world's growing needs. Um, as we see that demand increase, of course, there's more risk of countries not being able to ensure that energy security for their nation's needs. And more and more recently, we're seeing that risk, uh, as it increases, countries around the world are aggressively locking up long-term supply contracts to lessen that growing concern of energy security. So as that supply tightens and the price goes up, where again, we're seeing more technology being brought into the sector, such as small modular reactors, that more increase that demand and prove once again that uranium is really the most logical option to provide energy security and move forward. So I'll, I'll jump in there too, because we're gonna have a great conversation today. This is staring at us in the face, right? Um, Absolutely. Lack of supply, growing demands, blah, blah, blah. Where do we go wrong here? Uh, reliance. Reliance on other countries to, to fix uh, what we needed when we should have been doing it ourselves. So mm -hmm. again, Canadian, I'm speaking as though I am an American, but yeah. it's, a, it's a North American problem. It's a developed country problem. And we were too used to being able to have those, re those supplies ready for us. And, and over this past year, it's been a perfect example where we've seen the conflict between Russia and Ukraine uh, increase these talks of, of putting sanctions in place against the import of, of uranium from Russia. At the same time, now we're seeing Kazakhstan, the, the largest producer of uranium in the world, locking up those long-term supply contracts with countries like China and Russia, pulling it more or less off the table. Mm. And then on top of that, even the enrichment capacity that's being offered from Russia in the past, if we put sanctions in place against the import of uranium uh, from Russia, they're going to pull that away as well. So it really puts countries like the United States uh, in a very unique situation where they have no option anymore. We're not allowed to, to go back and, and have that as a safety net. They have to aggressively push forward with domestic production uh, and potentially, hopefully, even incentivize it. Yeah, yeah exactly. I guess that's my point. So you see an opportunity to have projects like this being incentivized by the U.S. government, potentially fast-tracked by the U.S. government on their mission to onshore uranium supply. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. it, it's been it. a growing conversation, and I think it's finally reaching a point where people are starting to pay attention. Yeah, so that's a okay. good point for us. So, just looking at the charts here, you know, it, it highlights that point that we just made. Uh, over the past few decades, uh, the U.S. needed between 35 to 65 million pounds of uranium just to, to meet the demands of their current nuclear fleet. But at that same time, uh, domestic production peaked at around 5 million pounds in the U.S. over the past decade has dropped off to almost nothing. Wow. So therefore, that, that safety net was really the entire reliance of what they need for their reactor fleet. Uh, so, uh, again, highlighting that point that there is no other option than to mm -hmm. really push forward with domestic uranium production in the United States. On that point, it really puts companies like Kraken Energy in a very positive position because looking at our current assets, we currently have four high-grade uranium properties in the United States three of those being past producers, which is a very important point. Uh, so anybody who's unfamiliar with uranium production and the history of that in the United States, it was really kicked off in the 1940s when the AEC or the Atomic Energy Commission was offering incentives for the discovery of uranium deposits and the production of those afterwards. Uh, when those incentives were taken away at the end of the 1950s, all of these projects that we're producing were shut down before meeting their prime. So most of them were shut down with resources and reserves in the ground, advanced infrastructure in place, and they've been sitting that way for the past 60 to 70 years. 
which puts us even in an even better situation where we're able to go back and cherry pick more or less through these properties and build up our portfolio as we go. So in saying that, uh, we're currently only looking at tier one mining jurisdictions as we acquire new properties and build up our portfolio, looking at right now, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming to, to reduce risk. Of course, we're only looking at properties with regionally high grades, average historic production grades up to and exceeding 0.25% U308. Across our properties, we have between uh, you know surface samples from 1% to 3% U308, which is very exciting. And again, a very strong focus on trying to select properties that have a conventional mineralization style or conventional potential mining style and being near or at surface. Apex being a great example of that with a current known mineralized strike length on surface of over 14 and a half kilometers. As I said, all four of our properties are in very mature mining jurisdictions. So they have road access to and throughout the properties, access close by to water and electricity, which is kind of a novelty in the middle of the Nevada and Utah deserts. And of course, we're looking at additional economic potential on our properties through value added metals uh, previously, uh, such as gold, silver, copper, and nickel. More recently on our two newest properties, uh, molybdenum and vanadium as well. And really what brings all of this together is the experience team that we have in place and we keep building on as we keep moving forward. I'm going to jump into originally high grades. Uh, I see 0.25%. I understand uranium, <clears throat> but maybe a lot of people out there get wowed by Athabasca style grades. And obviously they should be wowed by. But can you talk about like what high grade means in the U.S.? Uh, high grade, you know, it's really skewed, like you said, by by grades in the Athabasca Basin historically. But overall, uh, many of the projects operating historically throughout the world operate at a grade of 0.01%, mm -hmm. right? So we're a full scale above that at 0.25%. And that is very, very economic, especially at the, the price levels we're looking at currently as the momentum grows in the uranium space. All right. Okay. So, you know, at Kraken Energy, our strategic goals are quite simple. It is more or less to put in place a realistic and reliable hub and spoke mining model for domestic uranium production in the United States. Straightforward. Uh, what we look at right now, uh, we consider our Apex and Hardpoint flagship properties as having the potential to serve as that future hub of a larger model. As we bring in other potential properties, they will serve as the spokes to really build out that model and bring it all together. Quick look at the team that we have in place right now. Myself, uh, CEO of the company, I've got a longstanding history with uranium companies, specifically in the Athabasca Basin. I was part of the Hathor Exploration Team. Uh, and then I was with Next Gen Energy. I was the senior exploration geologist at the time of targeting and discovery of the aero deposit. Following that, I started up, or I founded, and I was principal of a handful of mineral exploration and oil and gas consulting firms in Western Canada. Our board is headed up by Garrett Ainsworth, uh, Garrett Ainsworth as our chairman. He was responsible for the discovery of the Patterson Lake South deposit, and most recently, to uh, prior to his uh, appointment as CEO of District Metals, was the VP Exploration at Next Gen Energy as well. Most recent additions to our team are Carson Halliday as CFO and Zach Hibden as our VP Exploration. Zach has over 20 years experience operating in the southern United States with junior and major mining companies alike. And a very important point is that he's very familiar with permitting processes for both exploration and mining, which is critical as we move forward on that front with multiple properties. Mm -hmm. What I really like people to take away from this slide is that we really do cover the entire spectrum uh, from grassroots exploration through multiple major discoveries, uh, through feasibility permitting, all the way through uh, mine operations. So that's pretty critical to a company at the stages of ours to really achieve our strategic goals as we move forward. Well, I'll add to that, even in your private company experience, you, you know, how many employees did you have under you? Uh, the most recent one, we uh, we took our company from me and my business partner to uh, 150 employees in about three and a half years, working mm -hmm. in 16 countries. So yeah, so you're a real leader, Matt. <laughs> we try to be. <laughs> right on. So just a quick snapshot of the distribution of our properties. You can see they're nicely geographically spaced across Nevada and Utah. All of them with uh, merits of their own, but but the biggest point being that they are in very mature mining ju jurisdictions with great infrastructure already in place. When you talk about a hub, would you say like somewhere in, in the middle of all those projects, or would you say one of your project would become the hub and potentially you'd get feedstock from the other three? 
uh, one or two could become hubs. Mm, okay. Because really, uh, another important point is that we never shut down our project evaluation process. We're always looking at new opportunities. We're always looking at new properties. And we don't want to stop at four. We want to keep building this up to be a much larger model than we already have in place. So looking at Apex or Hearts Point, I think they could serve very well as hubs of that larger model. Okay. Start off with Hearts Point, which is the most recent addition to the company. Uh, it's nicely situated right in the center of the Colorado Plateau, which we like to call the Athabasca Basin of the United States. For great reasoning, because it's produced almost 330 million pounds of uranium since the 1950s. But more importantly, our property is only 30 kilometers to the west of the Lisbon Valley Antipine, which produced 80 million pounds of uranium at an average grade of 0.3%. And beyond that, it's only 60 kilometers north by road of the White Mesa Uranium Mill, which is the only operating conventional uranium mill in the United States. Building off of that, uh, only 11 kilometers to the west of our property, another 300,000 pounds of uranium was produced, also at a grade of an average of 0.03% U308. And the reason that's so important is that at Lisbon Valley and the production to the west of our property, it was all produced within the Shin Lee Sandstone Formation. And why we're so excited is because on our property, we have three historic oil and gas wells, all intersecting the Shin Lee Sandstone at depth, all three of those showing off-scale radioactivity for the entire intersection of the Shin Lee Sandstone. So while this is technically a blind exploration target, we are very, very assured that once we recommence drilling, get back out there, we're going to see some very positive news coming from this property in a very short time frame. Do you have the logs on that? Yes, we do. Are those public? Yep. They sure are. Uh, it's a little bit of a tricky process to find them. you got to jump through a couple hoops, but mm -hmm. it's all public information. You can access the Utah uh, Oil and Gas Registry online, and you can go through those and check them out. Okay. So... Off-scale radioactivity um, can be a I mean a broad thing, um, <laughs> to, to, to a lot, and it can be a very confusing thing for investors too as well. And I think there's some confusion in the market about like how they're pegged to each other um, or how they're calibrated. I guess is a better sure. word. Um, yeah. Talk about that. Like, what's the risk? Yeah, you got off-scale over ten tens of meters or feet. I'm, I don't know. Um, so in theory, it should come back, but where's the risk of it not? Really, again, the risk comes down to our experience and our knowledge of uranium mineralization and how that relates to scintillometer counts, how it relates to gamma probe counts. So myself, Garrett, and our VPX, Zach, uh, we've toured this area. We've looked at the, the previously producing assets uh, at Lisbon Valley. We, we've looked at the outcrops around our property, and we were getting readings on our handheld scintillometer over 30,000 CPS. Right, so mm -hmm. 30,000 CPS on handheld scintillometer can be anywhere from five to 30% uranium. Uh, we're not necessarily expecting that downhole on these, but at, at, with spot readings going up to that level, we're quite assured that when we twin these holes and go back to the property, uh, that we will be seeing some significant assay results. Some some sizzle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> can you just like, are, are those holes collapsed or like, could you just downhole probe to save money? <laughs> Unfortunately, they are abandoned, so we do have yeah. to twin them before we start building out from that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right on. Carry on. So moving on to Nevada, again, nice geographical distribution across the state. Uh, Apex was the original flagship of the company for great reasoning. As I mentioned, uh, I think previously, it was Nevada's largest uh, historic producer of uranium, average grade of 0.25%. Garfield Hills, we did wrap up our maiden drilling program earlier this year with great results, and we're looking to plan a phase two drilling program early 2024. And Huber Hills was Elko County's largest uranium producer as well. So getting into Apex, greatly situated only uh, three kilometers from Elko and three kilometers uh, from Reno, Nevada. It's nicely situated only five kilometers south of the small town of Austin, Nevada. Uh, currently sitting at a little over 6,000 hectares, uh, great access roads uh, to and throughout the property, close access to water and electricity. There is a 3% NSR on this property, but it can be acquired back into a royalty company if desired. Uh, as you can see on the map right there, we very recently increased the land package by 2,400 acres. Very exciting on that point because all of that new acquisition, those claims are on BLM land and not on US Forest Service land. Looking at that as an opportunity to progress this property down two different avenues uh, to really minimize the, the delays along the way. And what kind of delays are we, are we even talking about here? So we've been working along with the U.S. Forest Service uh, on acquiring those drill permits for the U.S. Forest Service portion of the land. 
Uh, we did press release a little while ago that we've received a response from the U.S. Forest Service. They do require a few additional surveys before we can move forward with getting that drill permit. Uh, we're very assured that we will have that in hand early 2024. But unfortunately, one of the surveys is a raptor survey, and we have to wait for nesting season in early 2024. Mm -hmm. So because of that, uh, we want to minimize uh, the, the lack of progress on the property. And I'll get into that in one of the next slides as I show the targeting potential of CrossIt and why we decided to move out into the basin as well. Awesome. So just a quick look at the historic potential uh, or the historic uh, numbers from the Apex property. As, as I mentioned, it produced 50% of the historic uranium output in Nevada, produced about 106,000 pounds of uranium back in the 1950s. Again, the important point being that it was shut down well before its prime. There is still a non-compliant resource on the property, and it is based off this next slide right here. Looking at numbers like this, you know, three meters at 1.3%, 34 meters at 0.4%, up to 15 meters at uh, 0.5%, it's very easy to start building out a resource based on numbers like that. So once we do have our permit in hand for the U.S. Forest Service portion of the property, our initial focus will be to get out there, uh, bring this into a compliant state, and really use that as a base uh, to move forward with advanced exploration across the rest of the property. And as we move forward, developing our geological understanding of the property, we only keep getting more excited about the targeting potential on this property. Uh, it, it, it's more or less staggering. What you see here on the right-hand side is the recently completed VTEM survey, survey. The reason that we completed this was primarily because at the Apex mine and the Lowboy mine on opposite ends of the property, we see a very distinct graphitic alteration zone associated with the uranium mineralization at both sites. And that's all that white lines on over top yeah. the pink. Okay. That more or less continues along what's uh, labeled as the geological uh, geologic continuity of monzonite. So along that geological trend, we do see a continuity. And what we've done further to that is gone out and ground truth uh, radiometric anomalies along that trend. So we do see now a confirmed mineralized extent over 14 and a half kilometers on surface on this property. So very exciting, more targets than we initially thought we had on the property. And on top of that, we do see that trend continuing out uh, into the basin west of the historic apex mine. And we have further justification through radon surveying and historic drilling that show mineralized potential moving out into that basin. So on top of staking that new land, we've uh, engaged geophysical contractors to fly a high resolution magnetic survey to tie into our current da data set. We're doing a geophysical inversion of the VTEM data to estimate depth to basement in the range so that we can uh, fine tune our targeting. And we're also continuing with a radon survey out through that new portion so that we can move ahead very quickly with getting drill permits in place for the BLM portion. And as I said, move forward down two avenues, both on BLM ground and U.S. Forest Service land, so that we can get drilling underway as soon as possible. Great. As I mentioned, we're very uh, interested in uh, uh, additional economic potential on our properties through value-add metals. Apex is the perfect example for that. Apex started off its life in the 1930s as a silver mine with grades of up to 7,300 grams per ton. More recently, we've seen grades of gold up to 15 grams per ton. And one of the very, very important points of Apex is the continuity of uranium mineralization, where a 250 ton bulk sample was taken out of Attic 2 that averaged over 0.7% U308. So really the, the positives for this property are overwhelming and that's why we want to attack it on, on two different fronts and we don't want any delays. We're going to move forward as aggressively as possible. Can you talk about, speaking of continuity, talk to me about these these deposit styles, uh, you know, and the continuities like, and, and what kind of drill spacing do you need to do for area of influence? You know, to bring this into a compliance state, we could probably start off with 50 meter drill spacings uh, to build mm -hmm. up a resource. Uh, I would be confident in that and in what we've seen. It, it's not uh, as restricted as mineralization in some places, as you see in the basin, very vein hosted. Uh, of course, again, they've got very high grades, 80% and higher, but very restricted and 10 centimeters away, you can have 0%. Here, it, it's more disseminated across mm -hmm. a larger package within sandstone units or sedimentary units uh, where we don't have to be so restrictive in our, in our drill targeting. Right. Okay. So a little less risk than the basin. Uh, would, yeah, definitely. You say, yeah. And, and on top of that, the fact that it's at surface and near surface. Uh, yeah, cheaper three of our properties are conventional mining style where they would potentially be an open pit. Yeah. Uh, looking at not only uh, lessened exploration risk, but also streamlining the permitting process and moving forward to get these to a production ready state. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, you're not dealing with uh 48%. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> U308. Yeah. yeah. Right on. 
So moving on to Garfield Hills, uh, as I mentioned, we wrapped up our phase one drilling program on this property earlier this year. It's uh, nicely situated, only 12 kilometers east of Hawthorne, Nevada, great logistical base. The uh, property is a little over 1,200 hectares right now. Uh, great access uh, from roads across it uh, from previous exploration attempts, uh, close access to water and electricity. There's a 2% NSR on this property, but 50% can be purchased back for 250,000 US. Looking at some of the grades from the property, historically, uh, we were seeing grades of up to 0.26% over 14 meter intervals reported. Uh, from our drilling pro program, we were seeing grades uh, uh, you know, over intervals of 12.5 meters up to 0.036% U308. And more excitedly, we keep uh, moving forward with prospecting and ground truthing the radiometric anomalies. And now we're seeing grades in soil sample over 1% U308, which from a geologic uh, perspective is very exciting for me. On all of the properties I've ever worked on, I have never seen a uranium soil sample over 1% U308. Hmm. Uh, typ typically when we're looking at targeting, we get excited about 100 ppm or, or 500 ppm. Uh, for perspective, the highest soil sample we've seen at Apex was 600 ppm. And we were very excited about that. Wow. So 10,000 ppm in a soil sample is a very exciting uh, justification to continue moving forward and plan further exploration on this property. Now, can you calibrate CPS counts with those? Grades? Again, uh, CPS counts for anybody out there who's unfamiliar are very subjective to the um, age of mineralization. So the time from precipitation of the mineral, uh, from a, of the uranium mineral, to when we actually take a scintillometer count uh, definitely affects what the scintillometer readings are. The older it is, the higher the scintillometer counts will be because it's decayed more. So as it decays more and more, the higher the scintillometer counts. And that's also part of why the Athabasca Basin, even though they have spectacular grades, their scintillometer counts are off the chart because the uranium mineralization is much, much older. Yeah, well, I learned something today. There you go. So Thank it's you. not an easy thing to calibrate. <laughs> you you can do that once you have enough data, data mm -hmm. points, but that's something we're working towards. Yeah. So cool. So just a little look at the cross section through the previous drilling zone. Uh, we do see a rather straightforward geology, uh, which definitely helps us in moving forward planning a phase two drilling program. On you're targeting the, you're targeting the unconformity there, correct? Well, uh, it depends that we are, we're looking for more often the, the sediment contact with the unconformity. Okay. So it can extend either direction from the unconformity. We're developing that geologic understanding as we move forward, but it, it is great that uh, a lot of our mineralization starts at surface or within meters of the surface. Mm -hmm. Looking at the property as a whole, as I mentioned, we continue to go out and do further ground prospecting. We're now looking at almost a four and a half kilometer strike length on this property of sur surface samples between 0.16 to over 1% U308. And what that's really based off of is the next slide here. So what you're looking at is the airborne radiometric survey. The oranges, yellows, and reds are the surface expression of radioactivity as picked up by a, a airborne drone. Uh, and what we've done, all those po data points across the map, is where we've gone out again and ground truth these surveys to see if they were potassium, uranium, or thorium. And, uh, you know, to our delight, of course, we saw a lot of uranium samples coming up on these and identified five new areas of interest or target zones across the property. So we're very excited about this. Again, seeing soil samples over 1% U308. We're, we're looking forward to planning a phase two program on this property in early 2024. Uh, just focusing at the time being on Hearts Point and Apex first. Yep. And last but not least, looking at Huber Hills up on the north end of Nevada there. Uh, Huber Hills, it's only two kilometers east of Mountain City. Uh, there is no NSR on this property as was staking opportunity and not an acquisition, which provides great value. It's a little over 1,000 hectares right now, and it does encompass the historic racetrack open pit mine, which produced an average grade of 0.24% U308. Again, this uh, property was subject to the, the decline in uh, uranium production in the United States when incentives were taken away at the end of the 1950s. Some recent exploration was done in 2007 where 2.2, 4.5-meter channel samples were taken, coming back at 0.149 and 0.102% U308. And our VPX did go out and visit the property. We came out later as well. And the best sample we took off of it this summer was 0.237% U308 right near the uh, racetrack open pit mine. So great potential. It's a little earlier stage, but we are moving forward with the same uh, set out exploration process that we've used on every other property. Are there any new technologies out there to find uranium mineralization? 
Well, the great thing about uranium is that it more or less talks to us, right? With an uh, mm -hmm. airborne scintillometer, uh, we, one of our baseline surveys is flying a radiometric survey across these properties that highlights that surface radioactivity for us. Uh, it really makes prospecting a lot easier. We can just go out, ground truth these, and move forward with building up a geological understanding as we do. So uh, I love uranium exploration. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for lack of better explanation, uh, airborne uh, radiometrics are our, our best friend moving forward with early stage projects. Interesting. Um, I I got to believe all the bankers are calling you right now to raise you raise your money because <laughs> we've a had lack a few of... people inquire yeah. for sure. Yeah, um, but so how much cash do you have right now? Uh, we've got five million in the treasury right now. Mm -hmm. I think that might actually be one or two slides away. But okay, uh, sorry. We're, we're no, it's okay. No, not a problem at all. We're well positioned um to really tackle what's on this slide right here so this is just a snapshot of where we are on each of the projects as i mentioned garfield hills uh we finished up the phase one drilling program we're continuing with that prospecting with developing the geological understanding and looking for a phase two drilling program in early 2024 apex we're moving along on two different fronts as i said uh for the permitting on the u.s forest service portion and the permitting on the blm ground now so that uh, you know we can lessen that time gap from uh what was previously stated and what we've uh, what we've uncovered as being the reality of you know, permitting with the U.S. Forest Service. Huber Hills, earlier stage, we're going to go through that same exploration process of airborne radiometrics, magnetics, more prospecting, and then plan on phase one drilling next year. At Hearts Point, we're, we're really moving forward. We've, uh, we're working with our legal counsel out of uh, Salt Lake City and a very, very experienced uh, consultant who spent decades working with the BLM to iron out the wrinkles with the BLM's concerns right now and recommence drilling back at Hearts Point uh, as soon as possible. So that'll be, that'll that, be exciting. I, I I love the potential Hearts Point. I think that yeah, could be a that could likewise. be a cra that could be a crackerjack. I'm not sure if I've ever been as excited for an exploration project mm -hmm. before. So how reliable is that old data? Like it, it was drilled by a major, was it Exxon? I think it was actually a few different oil companies. They weren't okay. all the same, uh, but mm -hmm. but it is quite reliable. Um, using gamma logs in oil and gas drilling is a very uh, very reliable technique they use. It's done on every single oil and gas well as you go as you drill uh, to pick out the formation tops. It's yeah. not necessarily scaled to pick out radiometric anomalies because that's not what they're looking for. Uh, but the fact that it picked it up and the difference between the baseline radioactivity to what we're seeing in the off scale is very exciting. Yeah, and isn't it like that oil and gas drilling like a, a way faster drilling technique? So it's even it is it's yeah. more difficult to pick up the logs. It, it can be, and it can definitely lessen the radioactive reading that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when we run the radio, the gamma probes down the holes that we drill, we're usually moving at uh, a couple meters per minute, whereas uh, oil and gas drilling can be tens to almost hundreds of meters per minute as they're going down. So it does lessen the time of exposure for the gamma crystal passing through those zones of mineralization. So it can definitely lessen the response. Mm -hmm. There you go. There's a very technical question for all our listeners out there. <laughs> uh, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Um, besides, your, besides your 17 children. <laughs> <laughs> well, only five, but they, they definitely do their best. Um, you know, my answer on that question has changed over the past few months as we do see this, this increasing enthusiasm in the market for uranium right now. A couple months ago, I would have said that... Um, if we didn't see that that plateau in the spot price start to move, that was keeping me up at night, but it's changed now. So really, uh, not much, not much is keeping me up at night. I am very, very excited, as I said at the start of this presentation, for the rest of 2023. I think it's going to be very exciting. We're working on some very big things for the company right now. And uh, anybody who's paying attention should see some very, very interesting news flow over the, over the coming months. Mm -hmm. Well, your 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 stock actually hasn't really participated uh, along with some of the other names, and uh, maybe that is because of some of the the drilling delays at Hearts. Uh, but if so. you can, if you can solve that <clears throat> and show people, you could get some news out of that that could uh, really get the the motors running on that. So hopefully that comes uh, to resolve soon. I agree, and I am one hundred percent confident that uh, working with the, the team we have that we will get a positive uh, answer or decision on Hearts Point very quickly and, and recommence drilling. So I'm not worried about that. It's not keeping me up at night. Uh, so I don't think anyone else should be concerned either. Yeah. Talk about milling capacity in the States. Like who's, you know, there's the White Mesa mill. 
And White owns, Mesa yeah, is definitely uh, one of the logical options. Problem being that its feed capacity is much higher than one project can feed. Yeah. Um, you need a very, very large scale operation to feed that mill, or you need multiple operations uh, feeding it at the same time. So that's something that can be addressed further down the road. But we have been in conversation with, with other uranium companies out there. And uh, there are some more mills being brought onto, into production, uh, like refurbished. And other new ones are being uh, permitted right now for development in the United States in the immediate area around our projects. So by the time we get our properties to a production ready state, there will be opportunities for toll milling, for other agreements to be put in place to make sure that we have that, uh, that part of the process in place. Cool. Well, uh, Matt, that was fun. Yeah, absolutely. So just a quick look here at the capital structure while we're here to answer your previous question. Uh, we are sitting at about $5 million in the treasury right now. Uh, still a pretty uh, tight share structure of only 58 million shares uh, outstanding, fully di diluted, no warrants outstanding right now. Floating around that market cap of around 15 million uh, Canadian and closely held still with over 20% of the company being held by management and close insiders. And to really wrap all that up, uh, like I said, you know, I think we're very, very well situated right now with the four high grade assets that we have uh, with the time and place uh, operating in the United States with the unique, unique situation that the United States is finding itself in uh, and our properties being at that stage of, of advanced infrastructure where it helps us move forward with exploration and expedite our permitting processes as we go ahead. Uh, the additional economic potential from other commodities on our properties is overwhelming in some cases, so a great uh, um, step in the right direction. And I really think the team that we have gives us that clear path to moving ahead and bringing these properties into a production-ready state to really capitalize on the momentum that we're seeing in the market right now. So I guess uh, that more or less brings me to an end on the presentation. So uh, let's open it up to discussion and, and questions if there's more out there. Yeah, well, we, I think we had a great discussion. Um, and certainly, like, I, I love the the heart's point potential. And the apex is certainly very, very interesting. Talk about how the, the, the permitting process is different between you know, the BLM and the USGS. Uh, well, for the U.S. Forest Service land, it, it's really based on, you know, mistakes that have made in the past and and safeguarding the, the forest areas as of the United States, right? So it's, it's just a little bit more scrutiny. Uh, they want to make sure that people coming into those areas are doing things properly, and we are. So what we've done is we're, we're taking the standards that are applied in the Athabasca Basin, which are more or less the most strict exploration standards in the world for uranium because of the high grades that we see. And we're applying those to our operations in the United States to make sure that we are doing everything to the absolute best of our ability so that not only are we protecting the environment, but we don't risk uh, being shut down at any point in the future because we've overstepped. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really the difference is that U.S. Forest Service ground has a lot more protection protocols in place. Um, so looking at the response that we received from the U.S. Forest Service on APEX, uh, they're not concerned about us drilling there or operating. The community is actually very pro uh, our activities. Uh, we've talked to them all. The, the community members in general are very excited for us to be there, but uh, they want us just to make sure that our baseline surveys are completed. So we have to do a botany survey, archaeological survey, and uh, wildlife survey before we can get that into place to make sure we're not risking anything along the way. Yeah, especially for down the road. <laughs> exactly. Right, right. Um, a great question here. Are you targeting hard rock operations or ISR? Uh, so we're, we're kind of staying away from ISR projects at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned previously, our Nevada properties are all very conventional. So those yeah. would be most likely open pit mining methods. Uh, Hearts Point would definitely be underground, but I think it's very feasible to do a room and pillar style mining on that property uh, as we move forward rather than ISR just to save on infrastructure costs. Actually, and, and you know what, while you're here, can you tell everyone here the difference between the two? So ISR, it's just an injection technique where you're pumping fluid down into the ground uh, through a well system and then um, dissolving the rock, bringing it up and then separating the, the uranium from that, where uh, the room and pillar is an underground mining method where you uh, put a shaft down and then you more or less uh, mine out a room at a time, leaving pillars standing to support the underground workings as you move forward. 
Uh, once you reach the end of the mine life, you can go back and remove those pillars, replace them with concrete or something else to support the mine workings and work your way backwards out of the mill or out of the mine. Uh, where, of course, the uh, the conventional methods that I was talking about in Nevada, open pit is pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah. it, it's like an expensive gravel pit. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, Matt. Well, we're going to sign off here today. Perfect. Well, That's I appreciate we your time. Yeah, that was a lot of fun and uh, good luck moving forward. Looking forward to seeing those drills turn into Hearts Point. And uh, we'll sign off from there. Thank you so much. Awesome. You guys have a great, great day. Thanks a lot.